sprung forward. Oh, that's how you're starting? <gasps> yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a hate crime that we lose an hour of sleep. Yeah. I mean, it's on a weekend, and we don't work on weekends. No, but it's still so. a hate crime because uh, I, I lost an hour of sleep, and I think that's offensive to me. We're recording this now uh, post-daylight saving. Mm-hmm. P- is it P- regular? S- I don't know. I, can't, I don't know what which one's the regular one. All I know is this is the one we should be in all the time. Yes. More importantly, it marks the official beginning <laughs> of Oscar season. That's not true. Oscar season starts in um, August. July? Yeah. I mean, really June. June. Yeah. When the S- festivals start. Sometimes May. Anyway, we're really close now. We're yep. just a few weeks out, and that means it's time for us to kick it into high gear. So we're going to be talking about nominees today. Yes. We're going to run through uh, about half of them today, half of them next week, and then the Oscars will be on Sunday, March 27th. Unbelievable. Yeah, we're going to go just go through all the categories, talk about who's nominated, who should have been nominated, the mm. snubs, of course. No flubs yet. No flubs or post-ceremony. Mm. We're going to leave a few categories out. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But... In terms of our our metrics, how we go about this. Very scientific. Very scientific. Well, your approach is is fairly scientific. Well, there's there's general wisdom when it comes to to these Mm -hmm. things. There's several dozens of critics awards that happen in the lead up from critic societies based in different cities. So like the New York Film Critics Society, uh, LA, Chicago, like truly a ton. Yeah. Which make up part of the sentiment of like what's preferred over others. And then some of those critics are also members of the Academy. Right. Then there's the Guild Awards for all of the different, like the Producers Guild, the Editors Guild, Visual Effects Society. Um, the Screen Actors Guild. Yes, that's one of the big ones. Yep. Um, those are all nominating and awarding their peers that make up different sized chunks of the voting body. The Screen Actors Guild is the biggest because mm. most of the Academy are actors. So traditionally, the big four, which are just the biggest signposts in terms of what to expect, are the Screen Actors Guild because of the percentage Uh, of the voting body they make up. Right. Uh, The Critics' Choice, because that's the sort of the collection of all the critic societies. Mm -hmm. The BAFTAs, because of the Brits. Yep. And because those are very high profile for British award season. And the Golden Globes, which this year, I believe, have a far reduced significance yeah, um, well, because they weren't broadcast. Right. We've talked about the Globes in depth before, um, how they're very janky. Uh-huh. It's just a collection of random old white European men yes. awarding things, uh, famously biased. Yes. So the only reason they mattered was because of the public opinion, mm-hmm. because they were broadcast and viewed pretty widely in award season terms. Yep. And certainly um, by us. We yes. enjoyed watching and mocking. This year, they did not broadcast them. Nope. They did have them, but they were not shown because of uh, some controversy or another. I don't remember what. I think it was that they hadn't quite corrected any of their errors. Yeah. Um, in they terms were like, of like, we're working on diversifying and right. did nothing for a year. Yeah. And, and then I they were like, they, we can't do this again. They got into some some trouble for that and then decided not to broadcast. I don't don't remember the specifics. And frankly, I don't care. I think also whoever was supposed to broadcast it pulled out or they like, we're like, we're not going to broadcast it anymore. There was, there was a whole thing. Really. It gave me an excuse to not care about the golden globes, which I was like, okay, fine. I really prefer if they had done it uh, like as a radio broadcast, like in the original. That would have been fun. Era of award shows where it's just like a dinner that they're just piping sound out of. Isn't it crazy that people still listen to baseball? They still broadcast that That's on the radio and people so listen to stupid. it. stupid. That's baffling. I can think of few things more boring than watching baseball. One of them definitely is listening to baseball. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, the only good thing about baseball is uh, the atmosphere in the stadium of like getting hot dogs. Right. And such. That's what I mean by atmosphere. Right. It I'm, like so, hot I'm dogs. talking about like watching on TV. Oh, I know. And then watching on TV, you lose Sucks. the only fun part of baseball, which is the non-baseball part. Right. Uh, and then when you just listen to it, it's like, what are you doing? <sighs> I would not be surprised if there's people out there who think that the purest way to enjoy a baseball game is listening to it. Assholes. 
They're probably, assholes. but you're you're definitely correct. Like That's, the vinyl, they're you know they're like it's the equivalent of vinyl. Like it's right. it's the best way to. Except it makes way less sense. Well, you know the the projector, the feeder of the mind, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> my boy, is uh, so much more powerful than the feeder of the stadium. It's the purest way to hear the crack of the bat and smell the crack of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Nominated for best Nominated, picture this yeah. year. Those are the big four awards. <laughs> Also, there's several different um, sources you can go to for what has actually won the most things. Metacritic has a really good scorekeeper that mm. tracks all of the different critics' awards and things just for a uh, purely numbers-based look. Speaking of numbers, the number of nominations a movie gets is definitely not necessarily a correlation to how many they will win. But if a movie is good at a lot of things, it probably indicates that it was also good at those things. Right. Right. That's uh, and a, has a, a better, dumb way to put that. <laughs> but it's true. And has a better chance of winning something. Yeah. Just probability-wise. Mm-hmm. Most nominations this year with 12, Power of the Dog. You can listen to our episode uh, with a full in-depth discussion about that. Mm-hmm. And you can listen to our previous comments about the crack of the dog. <laughs> Your previous comment. My previous comment. The crack of the dog, of course, is what happens when you leave a hot dog in the microwave just a hair too long, and it uh, begins to crack open. I can't begin to get into the logistics of why you would microwave a hot dog. What? It saves so much time. And flavor, and... The, it tastes fine. <sighs> would you prefer a boiled dog? No, I'd prefer to not eat... A hot dog, <laughs> yeah. period. I don't like boiled hot dogs. You're preferred. I only like grilled hot dogs. Well, yeah, grilled or hot fried. dogs are the best. Like fried. Pan, pan fried. Oh. Um, ten nominations, Dune, mm-hmm. with seven, Belfast and West Side Story. We also did a West Side Story segment. Yeah. Uh, six, King Richard. Four, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, and Nightmare Alley. And then three and two have a bunch of movies. Right. Um, Basically all the rest. Uh, we are going to leave out some categories. We're not going to discuss the shorts this time. Um, what are we, the real Oscars? Well, we did last year, and we did see a good amount of the shorts last year. I was more referencing that the real Oscars got in trouble for leaving out categories, and people got really mad at them. Yeah, well, this year they, they're they pre-recording several of them. Yeah. Uh, which people are very upset about. Mm-hmm. I blame AMC for this one because they did their showcases where they you can go watch all of the shorts mm-hmm. um, in late February, and I was going to do it in the early March. And I didn't know that they would not be having them. So rude. Boo. Ooh, There's AMC. also two controversial categories that we're leaving out <laughs> in an effort to <laughs> make the Oscars appeal more to the masses who are dumb. They introduced an Oscars fan favorite category oh my God. where you can vote on Twitter, I think. You can also vote like up to 30 times a day, I think. There's some it, crazy... It, <sighs> like situation where it can be very easily gamed and apparently is being very gamed there has been a proposal before to introduce it as an actual category as the best popular film what which is where they would presumably take the top five or whatever gross biggest box yeah box office and then the voting body would still vote on which one was the best Right. But there's been a lot of pushback to that um, and to this. People don't like it, yeah. including me. Yeah, what the f- <laughs> Stupid. It's so stupid. And I, I saw someone's, I don't remember who it was, analysis of it that was really good on how it just further widens uh, people's impression of where the audiences yes. sit versus the critics. Uh, because it's like, oh, here's your own little thing for your little movies. Right. <laughs> And it, then we'll and talk if it's about a the real movies. If they're totally different than the ones that are getting awarded, then people are like, why are they so different? Right. It, it's it's very stupid. Um, I have not been tracking the leadership of who's, I don't know. There was a story right when it started that there was some like objectively terrible movie that was in first place. And everyone was like, oh, good. Oh, 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 yeah. I, I see it here. In early February, it was reported that Amazon's Cinderella was leading. The vote, That's it. Which yes. everyone hated. Yes. I didn't see it, but that was what I gathered. There is a second category. Is it best on-screen kiss? No. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, another fan-chosen category that they've introduced. And this one, as stupid as the other one is, this one, I can't even begin to process what thinking went into it. Okay. It's called the Oscars cheer moment. Oh, God. Which I guess, yeah. Is it the moment that like main audiences like. get out of their seats and cheer? Yes. Is it a moment specifically? Yes. So now, okay. Uh, 
this one, rather than just being open season like the other one seems like, oh there God. were five finalists announced. Is one of them when all the Spider-Men showed up? One of them, Spider-Man Team-Up from Spider-Man No Way Home. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the Flash Speed Force from Zack Snyder's Justice League. What? Okay. Here's where things get really interesting. <laughs> Avengers Assemble from Avengers Endgame Wait, that... in 2019. What the fuck? Effie White's And I'm Telling You I'm Not Going from oh. Dream Girls, oh. Oh. 2006. What? <laughs> and Neo Dodging Bullets <gasps> from The Matrix in 1999. <laughs> Why? And what? <laughs> of course, the final nomination, Train Coming Out of Screen, yeah, what, 1922. What even the fuck is this? Why oh. are they talking about movies that aren't from this year? And why is one of them Dream Girls? <laughs> oh my god. This, I, I, when I saw that, I did maybe a quintuple take <laughs> at my screen being like, what? That is so immensely dumb. That it's almost brilliant. I don't understand. It's like a parody of itself. I I do not understand. That's so funny. So I was thinking the category was going to be something like most TikTokable moment or something uh, like that, but this is close. I mean, I I guess it kind of makes sense as like a fun thing to vote for. I don't like it, but it's going to vote for Dream Girls. Well, why? Why are they included? (laughs) Why? If it was just movies from this year, that would be like. Fine, whatever. It would be really funny if they included like weird moments from the actual Best Picture right. nominees, like when uh, Cody McPhee, whatever, uh, was cutting up that rabbit. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what to do with that. I, <laughs> when Nanny McPhee returned from Nanny McPhee Returns. <laughs> I was just thinking about Nanny McPhee because I saw someone on the street and I was like, that bitch looks like Nanny McPhee. <laughs> ah, I thought you said Manny McPhee at first. That's even worse. It's a, a male version. So those those are the categories we're not going to discuss. No. Uh, but with that, maybe we should get into... The ones we will. Yeah. So we're going to start with Best Supporting Actress. And the nominees for Best Supporting Actress are... Jesse Buckley, The Lost Daughter. Ariana DeBose, West Side Story. Judy Dench, Belfast. Kirsten Dunst, The Power of the Dog. Ingenue Ellis, King Richard. Who's it going to be? Uh, this is the eighth nomination for Judy Dench. Mm-hmm. Uh, she won this category uh, for Shakespeare in Love in 1998. Crazy. Um, One year before uh, the cheer-worthy moment of Neo dodging bullets. Yeah. This is Kirsten Dunst, her first nomination. That's, somehow. huh. A little strange. What me. about her cheer-worthy moments in uh, Bring It On, where she was a cheerleader? That's true. I'm going to keep bringing up I know. cheer-worthy moments. She should have been nominated for Melancholia. But uh, oh, apparently was not. That was a good movie. That was a good movie. So in terms of the lead up, Ariana DeBose has 17 nominations for mm. this role. Um, not previous Oscar nominations. <laughs> this is her first. Uh, and she's won 17 times. Or I'm sorry, 13 times. Oof. She's the only one who's uh, in the double digits with their wins so far. Nuts. We got to do the snubs. Mm. Katrina Balfe in Belfast. Uh, I-, I expected her to get nominated not Judy Dench. Hmm. That was a little bit of a a shocker. Honestly. Interesting. Um, I still have not seen Belfast as of right now. Belfast is very good, and it's obviously not that Judy Dench does poorly because she's Judy Dench. Is she Irish? Uh, I don't think she is. No. I didn't think so. Um, does she do a good Irish accent though? Yeah, she does a good everything. That's um, yeah, that's fair. She's very good, but it's it's less involved than Katrina's, mm. who is really really great. I, th- I think she missed out on one here because she's, uh, she's been in a lot of stuff. She's um, the lead in Outlander. Is that what it's called? Oh, that yeah. Show. Also, uh, if it were me, if I was picking, I would have looked uh, maybe at nominating someone from Drive My Car. Mm. Uh, Toko Miura, mm. who plays the woman driving said car. Oh, yeah. She's driving your car. Yes. She has a really interesting role in that and... Um, I, I really liked her performance. I love that Jesse Buckley is nominated here. She's mm-hmm. amazing in The Lost Daughter. She she plays the younger Olivia Coleman like, oh, in flashbacks. Okay. And she's honest and has more to do than Olivia Coleman because Interesting. A lot of the action of the movie it's not an action movie, <laughs> but a lot of the big things that happen occur in flashbacks. So mm-hmm. she's doing a lot of that. 
All that said, yeah, Ariana DeBose, I think, is kind of a given here. Yeah. Now, this famously is the role that Rita Moreno won an Oscar for. Yep. For the original West Side Story. So that's a nice little uh, parallel. It would be... And I think it helps with her case for winning because... Agreed. Everyone loves a good story. That's true. And I wouldn't be surprised if they get Rita Moreno to present this award, expecting uh, Ariana DeBose to win, and then she doesn't. I could have done the uh, the research for the fun facts also for the Oscars that have been given to multiple actors for the same role. Oh, but there's a lot of them, I assume. There's numerous uh, off the top of my head. Um, Joker. Joker is one. Um, Although only one of them was alive. R.I.P. Don Corleone. That sounds right. Probably a king or a queen. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Th- so there's there's several. Should we move to Best Supporting Actor? May we please. Kieran Hines. Belfast. Troy Kotzer, Coda. Jesse Plemons, The Power of the Dog. J.K. Simmons, Being the Ricardos. And Cody Smith McPhee, The Power of the Dog. J.K. Simmons won for Whiplash yeah. in 2015. So this is his second nomination. And was in another nominated film, uh, multiple nominated film, uh, Spider Man No Way Home. Yeah, nominated for Oscar Cheer Moment. Oscar Cheer Moment and Best Visual Effects. One real yes. award. Um. He Yes, he's nominated in this for being the Ricardos. I'll get right to the snubs because he's the one that shouldn't be here. Yeah. he You you saw that movie. I did. Okay. I watched it with my parents. I despised it. I <laughs> absolutely hated it. Yeah, we didn't love it. And he doesn't do much. I mean, it, you know, he's great. He does what he can. But it's like, it, what, what was there for that role to do, really? Yeah, I mean, he he's just like a curmudgeon. Yeah, um, with some wisdom. With a little wisdom, yeah. And that's basically it. A wise curmudgeon. Again, another Belfast nominee that mm. I thought should be here, Jamie Dornan, who plays Katrina Balfe's uh, husband. Interesting. Famously of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Right, of course. Did he ever take anyone to the Red Room? Well, it was in black and white, so. Uh, to the, some of the rooms could have been red. To the uh, slightly darker gray room? Yeah. <laughs> who knows? I, you know. Could be. This was a little bit of a barren category. There weren't mm. a lot of potential nominees here, so... That being said, I think there are two strong competitors. Yeah, that's true. For many months, Cody Smith McPhee has been the, the the conventional wisdom of who's going to win this. He has won already twenty seven times Oof. with different critic societies and things. But Troy Kotzer, Kotzer, I'm not sure, I don't know. had a sort of surprise win at the Screen Actors Guild, which is also Coda won for Best Ensemble, which is like the big award at the SAG, yeah. which was like a huge deal. Um, so it got a really, really great reception there. That movie is so good. I and really he's, need to watch it. I, I was really hoping he would get nominated. And so the fact that he won that is is awesome. Yeah. I also love that Jesse Plemons was nominated. I didn't necessarily know that he would make it in, but he, I think that might be one of his best performances. And it's a very underrated, or under underrated, it's a very understated role. Um, and, and performance. It's very quiet, but yes. it's very... He conveys a ton of meaning in his, the way his character like mm-hmm. interacts with Kirsten Dunst and um, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Yeah. It, it's really super well done. Also, speaking of that, mm. this is the first time um, that two couples have all gotten acting nominations. Oh. In all, and they're in all four categories because Jesse Plemons is engaged to Kirsten Dunst. <gasps> And Cody Smith McPhee is engaged to Benedict Cumberbatch? Yes. Oh. Uh, And in Best Actor and Best Actress, Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz. Oh, I didn't know they were married. I I didn't either until this happened. Wow. I um, have stuck with the conventional wisdom because I'm a conventional bitch. Mm. Um, I guess if basic bitch... And you've seen the movie. I have seen the movie. Rude, but true. Well, I mean... (laughs) It's easier no. to root for someone if you know how how, how good, good they, they were. That's true. Um, and to be fair, if I had seen Coda, um, or when I see Coda, I could very well change my mind. In fairness to you, you don't have Apple TV+. Plus. That's TV, true. Which is um, where the movie is. And I, 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 if you're interested in re-watching it, I would love to watch it. Yeah, um, I would re-watch it. Okay, cool. Good. I have to go with the conventional wisdom here. Um, he did a great job. He won the Golden Globe. He won all of these awards. You're talking um, about Cody Smith. Mufi. Cody Smith. Mufi, yeah. Yes. Sorry. I'm going with Troy Kotzer. From CODA. Right. Again, the Screen Actors Guild makes up a big percentage of the voting body. And I think just the fact that it 
won that and ensemble means it got like a really good reception. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think its chances went way up in like best picture. Um, yeah. Also, no matter who wins, you win because it's either Cody or Coda. That's true. Also, no matter who wins, we lose. <laughs> That's the truth about the uh, Oscars cheer moment. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever wins, we, we lose. lose. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, and I hope it's Dreamgirls. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I want to create a campaign to get yeah. Dreamgirls, and I'm telling you, I'm not going. But, whoa, uh, okay. <laughs> to win. <laughs> We're moving into some of the technicals now. Best visual effects. Dune. Free guy. Is it free guy or like free guy? You know? All right. No Time to Die, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, and Spider-Man No Way Home. Right out of the gate, uh, it's going to be Dune. Yeah. It's won everything, um, and it should win everything. That's what I've heard and seen. Yes. I have uh, not seen the film yet, no, which we is are, insane. Now, before we record the next part, we will each probably have seen at least one more nominee. Mm. I've seen a great many of them, but not all of them. I have seen... Some of them. Yes. Even though it's a big sci-fi epic, it is not the same kind of CGI fest. Mm -hmm. Not that that's always a bad thing. True. As something like Shang-Chi or Spider-Man are, which are both great and have great effects. But yeah. it's 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 very different. It honestly, when you, like, when you think about the visual effects for something like Shang-Chi or Spider-Man, you're thinking of the big CGI moments yeah. and you're like, oh, that big fake dragon mm -hmm. no, or something. Dune feels real the entire time. Yeah. And it's like, it's so stupid, but it makes, it's like, was that giant spaceship real? Or was well, it like, Was it practical it, and like a miniature well, that it's they blew so, up? Or? It's, God, he's so good at grounding sci-fi. It's so yeah. fucking good. It's Dune. Who is he? Denis Villeneuve. But of course. Get to that to snubs for director next time. I've not seen Free Guy yet. I've heard good things. I know a lot of people like it. I heard good things. My um, mom really liked it. My dad really liked it. So may, maybe we'll watch that. Oh, yeah. Shang-Chi and Spider-Man, two nominations for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. They have 10 nominations for MCU movies. Mm. Uh, no wins. They've never won. Wow. For visual effects specifically? Correct. Although, if you're just doing Marvel movies, not MCU movies, uh, Spider-Man 2 won for visual effects. Interesting. Now, the, the short list for this, if we're talking about snubs, um, these are the things that made the short list for this, which is just the... Before the awards, they do a, a big vote that's just kind of a free-for-all. And then the top 10, I guess, mm -hmm. get into the short list. And then they do another vote. And the top five are the ones nominated. So these are the ones that didn't make the final nomination that were in the short list. Black Widow, Eternals, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Godzilla vs. Kong, and The Matrix Resurrections. The only one I can think of that was weird that wouldn't have made the shortlist was the Suicide Squad. Yeah, that could have made it in. Yeah, and I guess when you're looking at the other ones, it's hard to say like what gets included and what's not. Yeah. I have not seen Ghostbusters or the new Matrix. I have not either. Is there any that you think maybe you're surprised didn't make it into the nominations? I thought Godzilla versus Kong had great visual effects. Again, yeah, for sure. one where it combines practical because they still have dudes in rubber suits. Thank God. Which is the like anatom anatomically correct Godzilla has right. the proportions of a man in a rubber suit, right? And so when they animate him, he has to keep those proportions. Motion capture, and the easiest way is to yeah to do motion capture or literally have a guy in a rubber suit, and, you know, on a green screen, and then use effects to you know get the right lighting and yeah. Um, worth noting, the last three years, two of the winners were sci-fi movies, Tenet and First Man, mm. um, with nineteen seventeen in between them. So, yeah, this is Dune. If anything else won here, it would be truly disturbing. Yeah. Best cinematography. Speaking of visuals. Very much so. Dune, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, The Tragedy of Macbeth, and West Side Story. Cinematography, if you're not aware, is the visuals of what is seen on screen compositionally. So the way that a shot is set up, framed, the lighting the way that different props and actors are positioned, that kind of thing. Cinematography, you kind of, you can take frame by frame a movie and look at each shot as a painting almost, or just mm -hmm. as a, a photo. That's the cinematographer's job is to frame those shots. So like, if, just think of any like iconic shot from a movie that you can think of that was like really beautiful or striking 
I think of something like uh, Titanic. Yeah. Like when you think of Titanic, what do you think of? Uh, uh, the sweeping visual. Well, well, obviously the front deck. The you know I'm king of, king the, of world. the world. King right. of the world, which of course is a different moment than from them when he's standing, holding her. Yes, exactly. But those two Eve. specifically, yeah, like that. The or framing the of that shot with the wind, him holding her, and the camera like sweeping around them. Yeah, that's um, cinematography. Them fucking in the car with the hand on the window. <laughs> yes, the shot of the the ship turning upwards in the water. Oof. That yeah that. That one for cinematography. Did that one best visual effects as well? Because it should uh, have. Probably. That ship was... I don't know how well it's aged. It's amazing. I haven't watched it in a while. Perfectly. (laughs) Perfectly. The cinematographer for Macbeth. uh, This is his sixth nomination. Did you watch it? Yes, I did. It looked visually very interesting. Yes. It's very uh, German expressionist style. Mm -hmm. It's So everything's like minimal and bleak and very like hyper realized environment that doesn't really look real and it's not supposed to very stylized Mm -hmm. i mean it's a cinematographer's dream basically yeah and a good reason to watch it because it's it's really striking to look at we've talked about before i think with cinematography that like maybe that's the only category that could also take into account say like set design it's a big part of it because like production design the is literally set design's part of it but the framing of a shot obviously has a lot to do with what's on the screen. Right. So that movie, Macbeth, was like, it's all cinematography because there's very minimal set in terms of like just props and things, right. like set decoration. The sets are like big, gigantic walls and buildings and things yeah. that are fake, super washed out white backgrounds with big shadows and things. Yeah. It's really wild. This had to be nominated here. Mm-hmm. Janusz Kaminski for West Side Story, is a very frequent collaborator of Spielberg's. Yeah. He's been nominated seven times, and he won for Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. Wow. Schindler's List is another good one to think of, like, think of the girl in the red dress. Right. A lot of those shots are super iconic. Uh, For Dune and Nightmare Alley, they're both uh, second-time nominees. Hmm. And then I don't think the cinematographer for The Power of the Dog has gotten one yet. That was very good cinematography. Yes, beautiful. This is a kind of a toss-up. When I first started looking at writing notes for this episode, mm-hmm. uh, Dune and The Power of the Dog were tied oh, at 12 wins. nominations. And then Macbeth has six and everything else has less. Yeah. Um, and since then, Dune has won one more. Okay. So this really could swing either way. Yeah. I picked Dune in this one only because I, I just, I, I'm a huge fan of Denis Villeneuve, the director of Dune, and I just... Power of the Dog has perfect cinematography too, but mm-hmm. it's, I don't know, I'm just kind of a sucker for big, like, well-shot sci-fi. So yeah. I kind of, I had to go with Dune. But really, I would not be shocked if this goes to the Power of the Dog. I think it's going to be Power of the Dog, personally. Um, I think it, it has a lot of sweeping visuals, um, and that's a big indicator mm-hmm. of uh, success in cinematography. Did... Even just the, the like opening segment of them driving that the cattle drive. Yes. God, it's beautiful. The I think so much of like the positioning of people in compared to each other to indicate relationship um, or tension um, yes. is a big part of cinematography or just staging. Um, but it comes into play in cinematography because it's not a stage; it's your eyeball. Right. Um, the interaction between people and the environment. Um, you know, I think of the like final scene where Cody Smith McPhee is like sitting there watching his mother and uh, father-in-law, I guess, yeah. come home from the funeral and like the sense of relief that you feel, mm-hmm. but also like darkness <laughs> and that he's like watching over them like a guardian angel. Like all of that is cinematography. Yeah. Now, again, I haven't seen Dune, so I can't point to any examples there that were great, but I'm sure there's plenty. I think it's going to be Power of the Dog. Um, And again, a big part of it is that a lot of it is like sweeping landscapes, which um, is a a good indicator. Did Nomadland win Best Cinematography? Yes. That, this reminded me of Nomadland Mm. in, it's like, there wasn't a lot going on in the sweeping landscapes. Sometimes there was in Nomadland. In this, it was a lot of like emptiness, but I think that was kind of the point. Right. And it can sound like it's just... All you have to do is take visuals of really pretty landscape, but that's not it. it a no. lot of it. I mean, there, a lot of these shots are the way that they are positioned in it. Yes. And it's, you can make boring visuals out of a pretty landscape. 
for and, sure. And sometimes there are ugly landscapes that are much better. Yeah. Or sure. uninteresting, which again, Nomad in this land. case, yes, Nomad Land. And in this case, there's mm-hmm. a lot of uninteresting landscapes, but that's the point. It's showing like a, a void, like mm-hmm. a vacantness. Yeah. I, I was surprised to not see Belfast here. Mm. Um, Belfast is shot in black and white. Uh, well, like 98% in black and white. And no spoilers has, for the other two. Yeah. I thought it had really beautiful visuals, and I was surprised to see Nightmare Alley here over Belfast. Mm-hmm. Um, for this category especially. Uh, Wasn't Nightmare, Nightmare Alley, has Alley several like a noir? Nominations. It's, it has a noir aesthetic. It's, um, it's a Guillermo del Toro movie. Personally, wasn't a huge fan of it. It, it definitely makes its case in some other categories because it's a mm-hmm. very competently made movie. This this one, I think, was the most confusing. Well, one of the most confusing <laughs> for me because the cinematography certainly didn't jump out to me in ways that maybe other things did about it. So we'll get to ones that I feel were more deserving nominations for it. But I, I would have put Belfast here over Nightmare Alley mm-hmm. for sure. Moving on to best editing, we have Don't Look Up. Dune, King Richard, The Power of the Dog, and Tick, Tick, Boom. We know what editing is. It's uh, It's editing. It's when a movie's edited. Uh, But it's not as simple as it might sound, because the length of each shot and the way you arrange things is really essential in how a movie works or doesn't work. There are four previous nominees, uh, editors here. None of them have won. Hmm. The Power of the Dog has won five awards in this category. And Dune has four awards. So this is the other one that were, they were four and four when I looked first. And then since then, The Power of the Dog has won one more. So the opposite. Yeah. Um, Don't Look Up got more nominations than I thought it would. Yeah. Um, It's fine. And I do kind of see it. Did you see Don't Look Up? I did. Okay. So there were several segments that are very, like, they're basically editing to show what's happening around the world. Yes. The reception that this like big event is have, having, combining like TV feeds, social media, it's very well done. It so is. So once I thought about it, I was like, okay, that that makes sense. It is it is well edited. Mm-hmm. King Richard is an odd pick here. I think I, I, the only reason I could see it there, and I almost picked it, having not seen it, mm-hmm. is that it's has some sports in it, and sports tends to make for interesting editing. It, it definitely does have that like sports editing. But that's not the focus of the movie. It's more about the the With interpersonal the drama. Yeah, it's so an interesting choice. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though The Power of the Dog now has more wins mm-hmm. than Dune in this, I'm kind of betting on a sweep situation. For Dune? Where someone's going down the line and they pick Dune and then they pick Dune again. Yeah. Although it could go the exact opposite way. It could. If somebody picks Power of the Dog and then picks Power of the it Dog could. again. Or that they want to be equitable. And say, well, both of these are very deserving in these categories. I'm going to pick Dune for this one, Power of the Dog for this one. So right. I'm still picking Dune for editing, though. I am as well, just because mm-hmm. I don't know what else to do. Um, and that sounds right. We are moving to Best Documentary Feature. Ascension. Attica. Flea. Summer of Soul. Or When the Revolution Could Not Be Televised. That's one title. That is one single movie. And Writing with Fire. I love that three of them are one-word titles, and then one of them is like 40 words. <laughs> Has more words than all of the others combined. Yeah. Now, you had a big win in this category last year because you predicted My Octopus Teacher. Obviously. Which was a big surprise win. you have to see. Not just for me, but for, for everyone. How is that a surprise? I thought it was a shoe-in. Like, I personally thought it was a shoe-in. Right. Because, because I liked it. <laughs> the, maybe the only one you saw? Uh, correct. Yeah. And uh, it was really good. And it got so much talk. Like, there was so much mm-hmm. talk about it. Um, and it was just, like, it was it was great. This year, I documentary, I have a bad history of getting to too late to see any of them. I have seen four of these movies. That's impressive. Um, I've not yet seen Writing with Fire, but the other ones I've seen. And Summer of Soul is on Hulu. Um, Flea, where did we watch that? Did we just rent uh, it? I think we rented it. Um, it might have been on Amazon. No, we rented I, it on I, Amazon. Right. Uh, Attica and Ascension both are on Amazon. Attica, not to be confused with Gattaca. Right. Um, also, previous movies called Attica about Attica. Yeah, yeah, well. We discussed this when we had our episode talking about Flea, which yeah. you should listen to, uh, that it is the first movie ever to be nominated for Best Documentary, Best Animated, and Best International Features simultaneously. It's a, a That's a tough category to uh, 
like a tough collection of categories to align under. Right. The only other movie I could think that would fit would be Ratatouille. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Famous international documentary. Yes. Well, it's in France and yeah. uh, it's animated and it's based on, I assume, a true story. Summer of Soul, uh, according to that uh, Metacritic tracker, has 37 wins. That's bonkers. Flea has 15 and all the others have zero. So that's my pick. Mine as well, uh, just based on the sheer volume of wins. Um, I could see Flea winning because I don't think it's going to win any of the other categories. That's the only, that's the thing. It could surprise. Honestly, I really wish it would. Yes. Both of these are great. Flea is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Summer of Soul is really fascinating. So if you, you haven't seen this, right? I have not. It's about the Harlem Music Festival. It might have had a different name, but it was in Harlem and it was a music festival. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) In the summer of 69. And so it's... in the summer of 69. Exactly. Um, And it was all filmed, and then the footage was, like, never used. Did it feature anyone getting their first six string (laughs) over at the five and dime? Uh, No, I don't believe so. Okay. I I mean, there are several six strings in it that Ah, maybe could have been popular, but I don't know. Someone's first real six string. It would be shocking if it was their first, since they were all musicians hired (laughs) to play at this festival. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it was was never used, and then... uh, this is directed by Questlove mm-hmm. of The Roots of Tonight Show fame. Yep. It does a really good job of like combining the footage of the concert with people that were there, performers and just people like that were in the audience. And also with like the mood of the country at that time and why this was such a big deal and what it, it, it's really fascinating. So it, it's it's a hard pick. They're both very deserving. If it wasn't for all the wins, I would also look at maybe the feeling of the movie, because mm-hmm. if you look at the past several wins my octopus teacher last year yep. excluding american factory which is sort of more dramatic and then free solo the year before which is very inspiring yeah sort of feel good mm-hmm. and i think the last several years people want to feel good yep definitely summer of soul is more of a feel good documentary than yeah. flea is uh, or any of it well excluding writing with fire which i haven't seen but definitely definitely more than attica <laughs> it's not a laugh fest no and then ascension which is fascinating okay. i don't know much about ascension it, is a difficult movie in that it's very dry it's mostly not speaking oh, it's it's in china it's about the like work ethic um and sort of grind culture in china the like producer economy so it's like a lot of stuff in the beginning of factories just like straight up shots of factories assembly lines people working in factories and so because it's all of that, you know, those sort of mind-numbing tasks and jobs, the movie is, I mean, some people would def- consider it boring. Mm-hmm. I, I, in parts, was like, oh, my God. Is it, like, satisfying, though? Because I feel like I mean, watching I how it, it's made is right. just a long... I found it satis- like fascinating yeah. in that way. But then there were parts that, that stretch. Um, and then it also combines it where it sort of factors in the more consumerization of the Chinese economy Mm -hmm. um, now, like the digital age, they start showing like the influencers that are selling these products and like people working in more of like service sector jobs. I I think it could have been a much bigger player if it had made more of a connection between those things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it mostly sticks the landing, but if that kind of thing sounds interesting to you, I think you would, I think you would like it. Yeah. Um, just because it's, it's wild. Some of those things. Wild um, stuff. And it's not exactly like a how it's made, but <laughs> that's disappointing. There is one, th- several segments that they show inside a factory that's making sex dolls, <gasps> like real dolls. The like, and that one, I would watch a whole documentary just of that. Cause I was like, what? We talked about this while, uh, I brought this up to you. I was yeah. buying plants. See yeah. our previous episode where you talked about buying plants. <laughs> By the way, brief plant update. Most of them died. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Well, I say that most of the plant matter that I bought died. By which I mean the China doll, which is the largest one that I bought, is uh, crumbling. Oh. Um, but apparently it's also online lists. Every time you read about like caring for a China doll mm-hmm. plant, everybody is like, it's a drama queen. As soon as you Have buy you it, it's videos of like how to rescue it, how to uh, revive. Apparently, you don't need to. You'd literally just need to like put it in the, leave it oh, where okay. it is, um, and it's gonna die almost inevitably when you buy it because it's a change in temperature, lighting right. conditions, everything. But then it'll it'll come around. Eventually, it will return. Okay. Yeah, just like shots of like people like handling big rubber mm. titties. We need to do like, something about big rubber titties, by paint, the way. Like. There's there's a lot of discussion of them talking about how specifically to paint the nipples on one of them. 
also terrifying because I guess you can get them special ordered at whatever this factory is. And so one person's painting the face of one of them and he's got a reference picture of Ariana Grande. And it's like, (gasps) that is so disturbing. Yeah. Anyway, really, really uh, interesting movie. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still calling it for Summer of Soul. I agree. Highly recommend. Would you like to give us our best animated features? I would be honored. We have Encanto, Flea, Luca, The Mitchells vs. the Machines, and Raya and the Last Dragon. This is one I think the general public would have a lot of thoughts on. Yes. Given the popularity of one of these movies in particular. Flea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Encanto, of course. Yeah, which I still haven't seen. What's, now, what are you doing instead? Uh, binging Battlestar Galactica. I mean, fair. A number of these we've talked about, actually. Yes, we had episodes on Flea and on Luca and on the Mitchells versus the Machines. Yeah, which... Because uh, they this, all feature queer elements. This is probably the first year where we've talked about multiple yeah. uh, of the animated Absolutely. features completely independently of our Oscar talk. Uh, uh, and I have seen all of these. I have still not seen Ryan the Last Dragon or Encanto, which right. is crazy. Um, both on Disney+. Plus. Both on Disney+, Plus, which I have. Um, and Encanto, I mean, Raya is one thing, very good, but like, Encanto, it was kind of slept on. you really should have seen by now. Right. Well, it's everything. Like, right. it's, I also, I work with a lot of people who have little kids, yeah. um, like, as their children, not like they just, <laughs> they have some little kids. Oh, yeah. And there's like, occasionally people reference Encanto and the fact that it's like constantly playing. Uh, the last two winners were both Pixar, Soul mm-hmm. and Toy Story 4. And then the year before that was Into the Spider-Verse, which is Sony Animation, who also Loved. made... Mitchells versus the Machines. Which we also loved. And when we watched it, we did discuss maybe a Dark Horse Best Animated Feature winner. That said, I don't think it's going to win just because of the sheer magnitude of Encanto's popularity. Worth noting, in previous awards, now this is mostly like critics, uh, the Mitchells versus the Machines has 26 wins. Flea has nine, and Encanto has eight. Oh, so maybe the Mitchells versus the Machines will win. It's definitely possible. But again, those are critics. Mm-hmm. And this is a much wider body. Um, and, you know, actors, they have kids that watch Encanto. Um, they also just maybe saw it themselves, like me. Right. Uh, or possibly that's the only one that they saw because of their kids. And uh, and it's definitely the one they've been thinking about the most because it's everywhere. Yes. So I, I think it would be hard for Encanto to lose. Agreed. Best international feature. Speaking of things that aren't on the brain. That's true. Just in that uh, most Americans don't watch international movies. It's changing. We're getting yeah. better. Well, especially because they keep winning Best Picture. Um, or at least getting well, nominated right. for Best Picture. Not well, that that's an indicator that it's been well seen, if anything. No. Uh, <sighs> I think people our age are much better at our predecessors at watching things that have subtitles. Right. Best international feature nominees. Drive My Car from Japan. Flee from Denmark. I'm not telling you to flee from Denmark. <laughs> flee from Denmark. The movie's called Flee. If anything, and... you should uh, flee from uh, Afghanistan and... Uh, to Russia. Russia. And from Russia. And from Russia with love. We can't go through that again. No. The Hand of God from Italy. Lunana, A Yak in the Classroom from Bhutan. <laughs> sure. And The Worst Person in the World from Norway. One uh, that I have not seen yet, um, nominated in a couple categories, and I uh, I really would like to see it. I remember the trailer looked really good. What is um, it about again? It sounds really familiar. I don't remember. I just remember when I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, I want to see that. Yeah. And I keep hearing that it's great, and so I kind of don't want to look at it again, because I'd rather just go and experience it. I wonder if the Tinder Swindler is going to be nominated next year. Is it supposed to be good? I oh, haven't it's heard not it. Interna- well, it is kind of international, but maybe not. Or well, wasn't it a documentary? documentary? Right. Yeah. I've... I've heard about it. I've not heard any. I watched it. I, oh, did you like it? I really did. I've, I know I'm someone who uh, was Tinder swindled. Was Tinder swindled. Oh. But right when the story was coming out, and oh, so okay. she didn't get to. She didn't get any of the benefits of being Tinder swindled, right. like being flown to other countries and sure. you know three Michelin star restaurants and. Yeah, I'm gonna have to watch it then. This category, the awards go to the country, not to right like a person, and they bring in the leader of the country to accept right the exactly. <laughs> This is Japan's 17th nomination. It has four wins. Mm. Denmark has 14 nominations and four wins, including last year for another round. Yeah. Famously should have been nominated for Best Picture. Agreed. According to us. And a lot of people, I think. 
I, I mean, God, that movie's good. It was really good. And an American remake is coming. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, I think... Still starring Mads Mikkelsen? No, I believe it's, it's being rethought of as a comedy. Like, oh, a strictly God. a comedy. Oh, no. Uh, that, see, that sounds way worse. Yes, it does, doesn't it? <sighs> Kevin Hart, Kevin James... Kevin, Kevin Spacey, Spacey. <laughs> obviously. Uh, we just we just cast this. Bring thing. the space in. Uh, Italy's thirty second nomination. But they, they're a mainstay. Uh, uh-huh. They've won fourteen times. Good on. Them. They have the record for the most wins um, by one director. To be fair, Federico like, Fellini. Yeah, I was going to say like Italy after World War II, um, which was like the heyday of cinema in a yeah. lot of ways, the first golden age of cinema, I would say, or like mid and after World War II. And before World War II, <laughs> oh, that that whole corridor. Honest, I mean, between like ni- the like mid to late thirties, like pre, mid, and post World War II. <laughs> so all of history, <laughs> the entire history of the human race. Italian film has always been very important. Yes, um, Italian film has always been very. Important. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Good input. I, thank you. I took classes on Italian film mm-hmm. because I was an Italian studies minor, and uh, Italian film has always I been... I you watched some Fellini. I did. I watched a number of Fellinis. I have not seen the Italian nominee, The Hand of God, yet. Me neither. Norway, uh, this is their sixth nomination. They've never won before. Uh, and Bhutan's first ever nomination. Uh, yeah, I don't know a ton about the Bhutanese cinema. Yeah, no, I've never... Um, that's that I assume a yak in the classroom is. It sounds. It sounds similar intriguing. to my octopus teacher. I really want to see it. It's. It's not a documentary though. Oh, I, I more meant that it's the idea of an animal in oh, a learning setting. Right. Drive my car has won twenty nine times for uh, this category in other awards. Um, everyone else has three or less. And <laughs> worth noting, drive my car. Spoiler alert is nominated for best picture. Right. And in several other categories. So here's my thing. I think if. Any foreign film is nominated, or international film, is nominated for Best Picture, Mm -hmm. they shouldn't even do the category that year because it's going to win. Because if it doesn't win, that implies it is not the best foreign film, and therefore whatever did win should have been nominated for Best Picture. Now, I realize they could do the opposite. They could say, well, this is obviously going to win Best Picture, like in the case of Parasite, let's say. And like, well, let's give another movie a chance then because it's obviously going to win Best Picture. But that would imply that they're like meta gaming their voting rather than truly voting on what they think the best one is. Yeah, no, you're you're right. Now, I don't think they shouldn't do the category, but (laughs) Uh, it's a good indication of what's going to win. Or just if it's in any other categories, it automatically has a much better shot. Yeah. Which this time there's several flea has multiple nominations and mm-hmm. the worst person in the world is nominated oh. in a category we'll get to in just a few moments oh that being said only one of them is nominated for best picture and has nearly 30 wins <laughs> and that's drive my car which but i really need to see i enjoyed it <laughs> yeah well i it's... enjoy is a weird word because it is it's about grief it is a movie about grief oh. and it is three hours long oh it is exceptionally slow but it's, it is more than the sum of its parts. It is not for everyone. Like, okay. even though I enjoyed it and thought it was well done, I do think it could have been less than three hours. Because it is patient. <laughs> I, it is slow. You know how um, movies will have sort of the equivalent of a cold open where once they get to like the inciting incident, then they'll start to like roll credits, you know? Yes. Sort of an intro segment. And then they'll they'll show the title and or credits later. That happens forty minutes into this movie. Whoa! Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's a good indication of how slowly this movie takes its time. Wow. It's very purposeful because that's also part of its commentary on grief and how it. Yeah. It's a Lingers. slow. Yeah, that it seeps its way into your life. It's it's really honestly profound, and one of those movies that you like stays with you that you think about. The last three winners have all been not Best Picture nominated, but, well, two of the three. Another Round, mm-hmm. which should have been, yes. and was, had other nominations. Parasite, which won, and Roma, which should have. Yes. So, yeah, International Feature has been very high profile the last several years, and continues. Mm-hmm. I think it's Drive My Car. Almost uh, certainly. 100% agreed, obviously. Uh, we have two more to cover, and they are Screenplay. We will do Best Adapted first. The nominees for Best Adapted Screenplay are Coda, 
Drive My Car, Dune, The Lost Daughter, and The Power of the Dog. The two screenplay categories, of course, are adapted and original. Yes. Original meaning it's original, and adapted meaning it's adapted from Thank something you. else. Thank you. <laughs> I now, did plan on expanding on that, not just saying it like that. <laughs> well, uh, adapted can be multiple things. Right. Um, there are several examples here, because uh, Dune, The Lost Daughter, and The Power of the Dog are all based on novels. Mm -hmm. Drive My Car is based on a short story, and Coda is based on a French movie. Oh. So... So, Maggie Gyllenhaal wrote The Last Daughter and that directed. That is crazy. She wrote and directed The Last Daughter, The Lost Daughter. Did I say The Last Daughter? Maybe. I think I did. So this is her first writing nomination, but not her first nomination. She mm. was nominated for supporting actress in Crazy Heart. Interesting. Eric Roth co-wrote Dune with the director Denis Villeneuve and another writer. Uh, this is his seventh nomination, uh, and he has a win for Forrest Gump. Oh, he mm -hmm. wrote Forrest Gump? He did. Wow. And Jane Campion. This is her fifth nomination, not just for writing, mm. because she was nominated for director previously for the piano, and she right. did win in the screenplay category for her original screenplay for the piano. Right. It was in 94. So in most of the like scorecard compilations of wins, not everyone separates the screenplay category into adapted and original. Right. That so they sense. just have them all together. But that being said, The Power of the Dog has the most nominations. Oh. Or, sorry, the most wins. Yeah. Of anything. That sounds right. Um, And then several of the original screenplays after that. And then, so the second most wins for adapted is Drive My Car. Mm, okay. Which is like a far second. Interesting. So I am... I'm going with the flow here and calling it for The Power of the Dog, which is, as we discussed in our episode about it, brilliantly adapted. Yes. No, we didn't read the novel, no. but it's uh, highly effective in the way that it's written. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat sparsely spoken. Yeah. Not a ton of dialogue, which I think people, myself included, often think of screenplay as dialogue. But right. it's also more than that. Absolutely. Um, and even with sparse dialogue, and if anything, that makes your success at creating a good story all the mm -hmm. more impressive and therefore makes the dialogue that much more important so yeah. uh, i agree power of the dog best adapted screenplay i do have to say for dune as someone who has read dune several times mm -hmm. uh also very well done yeah that's all i want to say i can't wait to see the tall slug man oh i almost brought him up for a supporting actor but i was like i don't know best original screenplay belfast don't look up king richard Licorice Pizza, the worst person in the world. Oh, one of the internationals snuck in there. Right. Um, this happened before with, was it Parasite? Was also best original screenplay. I believe so. And at the time, I think I asked the same question I'm going to ask now. How do they do it? Do they read the version that we get as the subtitles? Do they read the original screenplay and just go like, yeah, it looks good? I would assume they have to be reading the... Or is it like a translation, translation of the screenplay, including things like stage direction? and? I assume it would have to be. Yeah. And again, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a good question mm -hmm. that I don't know the answer to. Kenneth Branagh wrote Belfast, directed Belfast, is about his life or upbringing yeah. based on his childhood. Um, In Belfast. Yes. Uh, he was nominated for Adapted Screenplay for Adapting Hamlet back in 96. Hmm. Adam McKay has seven nominations total for directing, writing, producing. He won adapted screenplay for The Big Short. Right. Which was great. Yes. Also, I keep, I had forgotten until I looked. The Big Short was not nominated for Best Picture, but Vice and This were, which is like totally backwards. But yeah, that's weird. Like The Big Short is easily the best one. Yes. Of the three. Paul Thomas Anderson, who wrote Licorice Pizza. We have not talked about that movie yet. This is his third nomination for original screenplay. Because he wrote Boogie Nights and Magnolia. Right. Um, he has five total screenplay nominations because he was nominated and adapted for There Will Be Blood and Inherent Vice. And 11 total nominations for directing and producing as well. He has never won an Oscar. That's crazy. Yeah, it is time. We said that The Power of the Dog has the most total wins for screenplays. The most total for an original screenplay is Licorice Pizza, followed by Belfast. Mm -hmm. I think those are the big contenders here. You know, there's always a discussion of if someone is due for an Oscar. It used yeah. to be a big problem. It, I think it's changed a lot, especially for acting, where someone would win for a performance that maybe isn't the best, but they lost previously for one 
And And potentially they're getting older and it's like, uh, we got to give them something. Exactly. I think that this is his time. I think that Paul Paul Thomas Thomas Anderson Anderson is going to win for Licorice Pizza. Agreed. Which is also great. Um, It it had a great We saw it together. Yeah, it was really funny. Yes. Um, I, I really liked it. I did too. In terms of original screenplays, it's very original. It is very original. It has original. a really unique sense of humor. It, it's also, I think it fits into the, um, in some ways, the mold that Oscars voters enjoy of like things about people aspiring to be in showbiz. True. Which they're familiar with. Showbiz and, adjacent. Yes, which I think helps. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I don't think they're doing it as an Oscar baity thing or uh, a Warren baity thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it helps. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a chance it could be Belfast, but I'm still going with Licorice Pizza. Agreed. Licorice Pizza. It they is. do have a history of um, not giving Paul Thomas Anderson the Oscar. So, <laughs> so. we'll see. That's uh, that's all we have for today. Yeah. Believe it or not, that's only half of them. <laughs> yeah, we have more to go still next week, so tune in for that. Uh, if you started this episode thinking, how could it be possible that uh, they won't be able to get through all the nominations in one go? Look, we have talk. Have you met us? We talk. We can talk about movies. Especially I, awards. I've really held myself back through this whole recording. Me too. I have a lot to say about all of them because I've seen so many of them. Mm-hmm. That said, subscribe to our Patreon for yeah. our three-hour uh, licorice pizza snub fest. We will also have linked on our Instagram, which is at QueerQuestPod, a ballot that you can fill out so you can compete along with us. Yeah. With our picks. See if you can beat us. In addition to checking out the gram, feel free to listen to any of the other episodes that we talked about. We referenced a ton of past episodes uh, because we like to talk about movies. So feel free to find those on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to this very episode. 